Hello, and welcome to A Little Room for Healing, where we talk a little bit about healing, and then we do a little healing, and then we talk a little bit more. Today, I have with me a fine gentleman named Jim, who is going to be uh, uh, sharing some insight on his years of healing and where he is right now on his journey. Uh, hey, Jim, thanks for coming in and being with me today. Morning, Joel. Thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure. <laughs> it's great to have you. Well, I feel like there's a lot to talk about today, so I want to just jump right into it. I hear that you're on a journey with your heart right now, and I'd love to hear more about that. Sure. About a year and a half ago, uh, I started having I, I started having shortness of breath. Not too bad, but it, it but it progressively got it got worse really fast. I went to the doctor, and they said you know it, it was um, a heart rhythm problem, which I kind of knew. I had had blo high blood pressure for a while. So um, I went to cardio sur cardio a cardio surgeon and they, they took a look around and they said, we need to put a, we need to put a stent in and um, your rhythm is really off. So they put the stent in, they controlled the blood pressure with some medications. They gave me a blood thinner and then they gave me a load of all different kinds of anticoagulants and, and I ended up bleeding internally. Um, I had to be, I had to rushed kind of to the hospital because what was happening is when I was bleeding, your hemoglobin drops and your hemoglobin is what controls, carries the oxygen to the muscles. So they had to give me a transfusion. I ended up needing five units of blood. Um, and then they wanted to find out where the bleeding was coming from. So I had a colonoscopy and end up end endoscopy. Um, which is the camera down the throat, and then a pill endoscopy, which I never knew existed, where you take a pill, it's about, well, it's a big size pill, but it'd be a mm. pill, and you swallow it, and it's a camera. Whoa. And they give you a little monitor to wear on your belt, and this camera goes through and takes a picture about every half a second, just blinks, blink, 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 and it goes all the way through your system, generating images, and then you go back. You never see that pill again, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't survive the journey. <laughs> doesn't survive the journey. Then you just go turn in the monitor, and they can then see everything from your from your entire digestive tract, from your mouth to your butt. Wow! Is and it like a three hundred and sixty camera? It, yeah, it, it just flows through your system. Oh, wow. So, so they look at all that and they said, "You're fine." Hmm. Um, hmm. Which I was because I had stopped bleeding and I had healed because I had stopped taking the meds. So that made me really nervous because I was starting to see the fallibility of the medical system. So I went to another cardiac cardiologist and he said, yeah, you know, you might need a monitor, but let's, let's put you on a nuclear stress test. So I took a nuclear stress test. That's where they inject you with radioactive isotopes and they take pictures of your heart in different, and then they give you another injection to stimulate um, the heart being being speeded up and you know it makes you puts it under stress like you're in like you're doing an activity and they looked at that and they said no and the guy calls me back a week later he says hey look every the numbers here look good see you in a couple of months so at that point i had been to three different cardiologists all three of them gave me a different diagnosis and a different procedure so i went to another one and he said, you're going to need every, you need an ablation, you need a, a heart monitor. And an ablation is where they go in with a laser and burn certain nerves of the heart mm. to stop, to, to control the, the pulsing. And being in the community that I'm in, or that I'm, that I'm a part of, I know a lot of people who do energy work. And I was talking to one of them and she said, she's kind of, gets, she's a channeler. She lives in Florida. And she says, look. Before they start cutting you open and putting wires in your body, you know, and I was thinking about this anyway. She said, why don't you work with some modalities, you know, because I have to change hospital. I'm not going back to, my, to the hospital I was at. Mm. I had too much bad luck there. And they're nice people. They mean well. And their technology is smoking hot. Mm -hmm. You get in the operating mm -hmm. room of Mount Sinai if you are, you're in a great place. It's like NASA. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, they work, the medical system works on numbers. It's, it's like, you know, it's pipes and pills, you know, so they're interested in fixing the, they're interested in fixing the disease, 
but they, they treat illness, not wellness. And so um, it, that's what I was up against, you know. So if they can, you know, they want to fix everything, but, but once they cut you open and start putting wires and stuff in you, then any chance of the healing modalities, it, it makes it much so much harder for them mm. to work. Mm-hmm. So I agreed. I had known about, and happily I have known people. I have a, a friend of mine who's a craniosacral therapist. I have a friend of mine who is a, a, does a vocal toning. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have um, a friend of mine who's an acupuncturist. And I have a, another friend who's a PT. So I started to marshal these forces and, and do sessions with them to get the positive energy. And, and I have my own work to do there because I can't just keep lying on tables and, and having somebody, you know... <laughs> tone or touch or over me you know which is easy i also have to have i also have to really develop and be disciplined with a real good personal practice what is what would you say is a personal practice that would help you wake up in the morning have cacao not coffee Hmm. Um, meditate do an exercise practice mostly yoga and journal Hmm. that's my morning practice Hmm. And that, but if you do all that, then it's time for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unless you wake up at four a.m. <laughs> yeah, so so that's the that's the challenge because I know I can't just depend on energy coming into my body to try to heal. You know, uh, also I, I forgot. I'm sorry. Um, I also tried biomagnetic um, therapy, hmm. where they put magnets on your body, positive and negative. Oh wow! And they're able to read they're able to read where the where the pH in your body is off because the magnets will will read you know if it's balanced the magnets are fine if not it, the magnets cause the muscles to contract so you can see where they can contract and then the magnets balance out the pH you take sometimes it's too acidic sometimes it's too alkaline mm. so the magnets balance out the pH which is good for healing the heart it's also he- good for healing my knees which have been ravaged by arthritis how long have you been working with these um, all of this in, in context, um, I mean, I used to do some of it sporadically from time to time just because it was kind of like a cool thing to do. But now I'm basically every two weeks, um, what every, all of these people, I'm setting up a schedule where I see, see them every two weeks, but they'll alternate. Like, so if one week I do the healing, the next, the magnets mm, right. on the next week, I'll do the, the, the toning next week. You know, so it's, it's breaking them up. Now I thought about it too, is if you, if you put these modalities too close together, they'll bump into each other. Mm. It's kind of like in plant medicine, if you drink, have ayahuasca and MDMA right on top, you know. So it's 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 that kind. You got to let the modality do its work. It doesn't happen right. instantly. Usually, it takes twenty four hours for the effects of a good. For me, anyway, it's how it works. And so, like I noticed the next day, there are lots more synchronicities. People who had, you know, people work stuff and friend stuff and just things like somebody who I hadn't talked to in in years, you know, shows up. I mean, not not in any the years when there was no fallout. It was just natural. Right. So there was there was a lot of this kind of synchronistic stuff happening, and I usually tended to feel better. This heart condition leaves you feeling most of the time drained, mm. like ugh. Like I was talking to a group of people about life force. It takes away life force, which is a really, it's not energy. It's a, it's a, it's a, it, it's a thing that you don't realize it's gone until you get it back. And when it comes back, like, oh, I remember him. You know, it's like a part of your personality. Are you finding that these modalities that you're working with are helping bring that yeah. life force yeah. back. Yeah. That's so, what I said. The next day I feel better. Okay, yeah. It's like, oh, okay, okay, I can do that. Um, so I'm trying, but I know, and I will be upfront about this, I know that none of this stuff will work if I don't provide personal discipline to it. Mm. And that's the, that's the challenge for me. Yeah. Um, because I worked really hard almost my whole life. Mm. And when I wake, and I only do consulting work now, it's, it's, it's easy, it's light. But man, when I wake up in the morning, I'm still, and it's been 15 years, and I'm still like, oh God, I don't have to go to work today. Yet. 
<laughs> and, and do you attribute that to being part of the challenge of getting up and yeah. motiv- motivating yeah. yourself yeah. to I, do I'm this? C- kind I'm of work. celebrating freedom yeah. rather yeah. than doing discipline. <laughs> <laughs> Every day. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's I the weekend. I don't blame you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for for a long time, I had a I had a a thirty year career, and for the last fifteen of them, easily, I raised two kids by myself. Mm. So I was pretty burned out in the end. You know, that's a 24-7 type of thing. Right. Um, so, um, and then this happened, you know, and it just, it stopped me in my tracks. It just, it just, you know, I was working here yesterday. I was pushing. Like mm-hmm. I have seldom pushed in years. Because by, if I'm fizz out and about a little bit, usually by 10, 11 o'clock, I'm like, I got to sit down. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really hard for somebody like me. Do you, did you, let me ask you, is there fear? Do you have fear regarding your heart? There's some, there's some, there's some fear there. Um, you have to be careful. You know, it'll come up. I've had to look at, I've had, I have looked at dying. Hmm. Cause you're in, well, now we're in the, you know, we're in the red zone. Hmm. You know, I'm 74. I have a heart problem. I've got bad knees, which restricts my mobility. Um, but what it does do, and this is the interesting thing, when you do look at that, you're in a different headspace. And you start to, what happens at first, really what happens first, is you, you kind of like start to look back on your life. And you say, well, I did this, I did that, I did that, I did that. And you start to, you look, you start to look at all the things that you've done. Uh, as a friend of ours, David, once told me, he said, well, you had a good run. Um, <laughs> and do you, st- do you agree with him? Yeah. <laughs> good. Yeah. yeah. It's been, it's been, it's been a, it's been an, a wonderful, interesting, you know, the last, you know, since I was like 19, it's been a real roller coaster. Mm-hmm. Um, but you become introspective. And you start to realize that a lot of the things that used to occupy your brain aren't there anymore. I'm not worried about getting married. I'm not worried about having kids. I'm not worried about buying a house. I'm not worried about a career. That creates an enormous amount of headspace. Mm. It's like, I don't have to worry about these things anymore. And so you become maybe not wiser, but a little older. And you, you, it, it's hard to move into this kind of like older man phase. It's, I'm in transition now between this guy who used to hop around, you know, for 16 hours a day with a drill in his hand to a guy who can't even walk around the room for a half an hour with a drill in his hand. That's hard to accept. And the truth of it is, it's hard to accept when you depend on your image of that guy running around for 16 hours a day with a drill in his hand and he can't do it anymore. It diminishes you unto, you, unto yourself. And that's an adjustment. You know, um, I had a bunch of things I wanted to do yesterday. I was fairly successful, but I got up this morning and I said, there's no way I'm taking out the tools today. I just don't have it. You know, it'll be in, I'll be into a job for five minutes and I'll, I'll give it up. So that's the challenge. It's, it's the emotional challenge. But yeah, I do. When I first had this, I also had about a really bad insomnia. And I wasn't sure what the insomnia was from. But I would go like two or three days without sleeping, as well as having a heart condition. And that was a really terrifying place. You're not sleeping. You can't walk. You can't breathe. You're like, oh, mm. whoa, you know, better start getting those bank account numbers in order yeah. for my son. <laughs> when I hear those symptoms, I get claustrophobic. Yeah. Like that's the feeling that goes over my whole body is claustrophobia. I can't move, can't breathe. Like, yeah. oh, God, I just want to. <gasps> yeah. I use television as an escape, mm. huge escape, you know. Um, so that's what's been going on. So now I want to, tr- you know, it's a, now I I want to, I have to do all the things that I've always wanted to do, you know, if I'm going to, if and, and you have to rely on your intuition. Like the decision to slow down the Western medicine. I mean, I could be, I could be sitting here talking to you right now with a pacemaker in my heart and an ablation done. Mm-hmm. Um, so to slow down that process, to give these other processes a chance to work. Um, that's a close call. It was like 49 versus 51%. It was really, but I had to say that 
it was more abhor- going to the hospital, and I had I had the pacemaker set up. I canceled it the day before. Wow. Yeah. Just to, and that's had, quite a decision. Yeah, I had it was I was I had the appointment. I was scheduled, and I and the hardest conversation I had to have was I have a general practice. I have a regular doctor, which is really just like you know, just, okay, go see him, go see him, you know, that kind of right. thing. And I had I had to convince her that what I was doing was the right thing. So I, 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 and she was like, you can't do that. I said, I'm going to do it. You can't. Said, Look, tell you what, I said, I'll put you in charge. Every two weeks, I'll come see you and we'll do an EKG. You can take my blood pressure. My, I, have, I always take my own blood pressure all the time. That's almost de rigueur now. Um, so she said, okay, we'll do it. We'll try. So it was wow. a lot of, it was a lot of work to convince a lot of people. I saw a lot of people's eyes get really big. Really big, yeah. Yeah. Uh, question I have a question. This is coming up. How did you go from being, the guy who runs around 16 hours a day with a drill in his hand in that environment with uh, other men who are running around 16 hours a day with a drill in their hand and get into uh, the even the acceptance or possibility that he, uh, other healing modalities or maybe what some people might call woo-woo things uh, might be beneficial for you. Yeah, there's, there's, there's an overlap there. Um, I left the business with the guys running around 16 hours a day with the drill in their hand. Um, in 19, no, in 20, 2007 is when I, is when I walked away from the job. At that point I was an executive, but I was on, on job sites all the time. Mm. Um, so and then over the last 15 years, I have been dabbling or playing, I play in the fields of the Lord, to, hmm. use, to use Peter Matheson's expression. Hmm. Um, and so I, that's why I did trips to Asia. You know, I did all the, I checked all the, the spirituality sacraments. You know, hmm. I've, been to, I've been to Nepal, I've been to Bhutan, I've been to Tibet, I've been to India, I've done an ashram, I've done dietas in the jungle. I've hmm. been playing with this stuff as a way of exploration, and just, a na- it was a natural calling to it, as a way of exploration, but always for everybody, for me and for everybody that I know that's done it, eventually you go through those things and you come home, mm-hmm. and where that's where you are. I had checked the box, so it wasn't always out there, it's like, maybe I should have gone to, to, to that ashram in Peru, and, and that, uh, mm-hmm. I did it, so I took all of that off the table. And when you did all those explorations, um, and you say you, did that and check the box. Yeah. When you came back home, you did you bring something from those things with you that maybe yeah. that, that offered yeah. some shift in your life? Yeah, I yes, some of it was not what you might expect. Some of it was like, okay, that's, you know, you go to enough Buddhist temples and you get a really good, you know, in 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 in, in Nepal and in and in Tibet, you know, where it's really serious business. Um I kind of like realized that I didn't I didn't need to become a Buddhist monk hmm. you know it's just not hmm. in my DNA you know it's just not there mm-hmm. I could take the lessons but you know I'm, I am a Western man and I have lived in the Western culture my whole life and um, that's that's kind of like what I what I brought back um, it's like even the healing even the healing modalities I mean we all know lots of places with lots of people doing lots of things who really don't know what they're doing but it it's fun it's a kind of a collective high but it's really not i become a lot more serious now I mean, it's like you know they're all of the in the contemplation you realize that you really didn't do anything you were just there when the stuff went down and you participated in an event even if it's your own wedding you know, it's just these, in my life, these things happened. And I was there when they happened. But none of them will I take credit for or blame for. Because you realize that when you get to this point, you know, both my parents are dead, I lost a son, that so many of the things that we hold emotionally, deeply sacred, there's a lot of conditioning in it. And when you look at the things like losing a child, losing a wife, um, losing and losing your health, those are just things that happen. And if you try to get to, that's this. This came from this. 
when you try, if you try to get too deep, if you try to start taking credit for stuff, then you have to take the blame. You know, and and some of the things that happen on the blame side are just too too huge to to absorb. You have to just say that's God, that ain't me. I can't, you know, I can't do that. I it can't be. That happened from losing a son. I learned I learned that there. Uh, so there was just a lot of a lot of that in there. Are you open to talking about your son sure. and how you lost him and sure. what that experience was like for you? Yeah, my my son. I have two sons. And this is this is to give you a real understanding of dichotomy of children. My younger son is a doctorate of opera performance and music education. My older son was a heroin addict. Same house, same school, same everything. Same parents, same teachers, same food, same everything was the same. Um, but he was very smart, but incredibly insecure. He did not play well with others, so he was restricted to a certain group of people. And one of them was a, a really nice kid, but whose brother sold sold heroin. And uh, somehow Christopher got into it, and it went on. It was a 20-year journey with him as an addict, with jails and rehabs and courts and halfway houses and drug court and arrests, embezzlement, abscesses from needle. I mean, I have not heard one story in addiction and recovery that I did not experience. It was 20 years of... Uh, expensive rehabs, not expensive rehabs. But in the end, he got into a rehab called St. Christopher's, which is up in Garrison, and it was great. It was the only 90-day rehab I ever heard of. 28-day rehabs just get you clean and make you want to do drugs. <laughs> you know, people, they're like, but 90-day rehabs, it breaks the cycle and creates a new cycle. So when you get out, you have a new cycle of living. And he did okay. Stayed in a halfway house in Brooklyn, which is we are really bad places, halfway houses. Best places to find drugs in the world is in a halfway house. Oh. And you get robbed all the time. It's kind of like a, just like a shelter. What was your relationship with him while all that stuff was going on? Like, was it volatile? Was... No, it wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't volatile. I was pretty strict about it. You know, I wouldn't let him in the house anymore. I mean, every time I let him in the house, like something ended up missing. Because there was always theft. I mean, even you know, money from my wallet. Um, I had a retirement watch. You know, that's gone. Um, so I was I was able to keep it cordial and friendly and help where I could, but I was also I also had to protect myself mm. and my and the rest of my family from him. Um, in the end, though, when he got out of St. Christopher's, uh, I picked him up. Took him to Brooklyn, where his halfway house was. And then, for the next three years, I made a promise to myself that I would we would see each other every week. Because now he's in the city, I'm in the city. So we would get together every Sunday. I mean, every Sunday for, wow. th for three years. And That's we'd go have a pizza. Incredible. Maybe go, i go to his. So he was in the halfway house. Then he got on this lottery system for apartments for, you know. And he got one. And his apartment was nicer than mine. <laughs> it's a brand new development, Staten Island. So he was in there. And um, so you have all that energy of moving and setting up a new house and yeah, 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 yeah. But Staten Island's a little isolating. You know, you want to do anything, you got to take a train and a ferry. And that deep of an addiction that he had, there's two phases to it when you recover. The first phase of recovery is what they call the pink cloud. <gasps> You're like lying on your face in the mud and you pick your head up and you feel the sun on your face and you're like, that's the first time of being not, of, be, of being straight in years. I say, like, wow. And then you look behind you and you realize all the work that you have to do now to rejoin the human race. Get a job, get a house, get a, you know, all those things that you don't have. And also addiction will stunt or stop your emotional growth at the time you start doing it. So I really had a 34-year-old son going on 19. And, but he did okay. He got in, we did it, and we saw each other, and we did the thing. 
but I could see him descending. I could see him getting smaller. And he was a big guy, but I mean emotionally smaller. And I realized that the work that he has to do, I can't do, for, he has to do it. I can't, you know, I'm just, I can't do it for him. And I could see his life was descending into food and television. Hmm. You know, and I got that. I understood that. I have those tendencies. And then one day I got a call from the police. I thought he had been arrested. That was my first thought. And they said, no, they found him. He passed away. It was a drug overdose. It was heroin cut with fentanyl. And he knew it. He knew it was hot because he only snorted it. He didn't shoot it. And he was a shooter. Oh, wow. So he knew he was his stuff was touchy. And it probably might not have, if somebody like me or anybody, it might not have killed them. But his physical condition had so deteriorated from 20 years of addiction that his heart was, weak. you know, he was just, it was, it was, it killed him. It just overpowered him. So, um, there's a whole process you go through internally when something like that happens. And in the end, for me, I went to sound bath meditations. I went to Reiki sessions. I went, I did everything I could to try to like go inside and see what was, you know, what was really going on in there. Like in one, in one sound ceremony, um, I was meditating and I, I, the vision came to me of him in his apartment lying on his sofa and he was dead. And this, out of him rose this silhouette that was like him, but it was all light, thousand little lights. It was just his body of lights. And it looked around and then it looked at me and said, I am so fucking out of here. <laughs> 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 I thought that's cool. <laughs> I can do that. In the end, what? You, but in the end, what you're left with, what I was left with, was how much suffering this one guy had in 34 years. Him and the reason my wife left was probably because the two of them were almost ready to start stabbing each other. She was really unstable, and having a kid like that. It, 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 she didn't know what to do, you know. Um, so that that got that didn't help. It really didn't help. So in the end, all I could all I could, and I saw a lot of it. I mean, I've seen my son in more handcuffs and jumpsuits and lining up in the judge before the judge. I can can tell you how many times, you know. Um, it's like a, it was a way of life. It wasn't, you know. I, cops came to the house one Sunday one time for something. It was Mother's Day police came to the house and took him out in handcuffs because he was he was selling fake Rolexes on the internet <laughs> so he was a clever guy mm. uh, I'm, I really want to stress that in the end what you're left with is the amount of pain he was in and you know some of that I contributed to not deliberately but or consciously but unconsciously I, I could have done better at certain times and I didn't see it a lot of it was I was so tired Mm. That I'm, I'm, I was just trying to keep the lid on everything. I was trying. I wasn't trying to make things better. I was just trying to st not let things get worse. And so, um, but after he passed away, I had a really, and I got sick like this too. I really had a chance to like feel inside of him and think, my God, the amount of suffering. You know, his only girlfriend was was like a, a drug prostitute. You know, who used to, you know, prostitute herself to get money for drugs and then they would get high. That was like his love life. There was so much pain and suffering. It was, and I'm a guy who fixes things. That's my thing. Mm -hmm. I fix shit. You yeah. Know, if it's broken, mm -hmm. I'll figure out a way. Uh -huh. um, and I couldn't fix that. I just couldn't fix that. So I, that's something that I live with. It's like, okay, suck it up. You know, and that he really, really, I mean, at the end of the run, he got, he was in jail for, for eight months for embezzlement, got out of jail and was, got into St. Christopher's and I took him from, from Nassau County Jail to, to Grand Central and put him on the train to go up there and he got up there. But prior to that, he had had some problems with his gallbladder and he went in the hospital and he came out of the hospital with an infection between the lung and the lining of the lung. It's called a pleural effusion. And they sometimes try to get the infection out by just going in there and vacuuming it out. 
and they couldn't do it. So they had to open him up and take every, you know, and then he's got a scar, on his, he had a scar on his back like this long, wow. about two feet long. So he's in peak skill in the hospital. I'm in New York. It's over Christmas time. And I'm going up there every other day. Take the train up to Peak Skill, go to, get a cab, go to the hospital, spend some time back and forth. So it was right at Christmas time. So I went up there on Christmas Eve, and he was out. They had him. They had him sedated. So I went back up there. I was going to go back up there the day after Christmas, but he came out of the sedation. He was stable, and the rehab place came and picked him up. Had, which was fine. I was like, great, not my job, you know, terrific. But I thought about that, you, you know, I'd say, here's this guy, he gets out of the hospital, he's overweight, he's lost at least half of his teeth because heroin will rot out your mouth. It dries out your whole saliva system mm -hmm. and that causes tooth decay to just expand. He wore glasses, he had no glasses, he had no teeth, he had no money. He had a couple of things of clothes in a hefty bag. That's it. That's his life at 34. And I can't even imagine what that must feel like. How much suffering that, you know, how much despair. The weight of that. And now you got to go to this strange place. Here's your bed. Dinner, breakfast, is it? You know, it's, it's, I really, really still feel that. That level of just despair. It's like, oh, and, and you can't get high anymore. <laughs> you know, there's no escape. So that's Christopher. Um, what year did he pass away? Uh, let's think. Where were we at now? 23? 18? 2018. Yeah, about five years ago. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all that. You're welcome. For your story. Um, Can I just add something? Please. It makes it easier to talk about it out loud. Hmm. Makes it a lot. I mean, when I have to say, you know, when I say that, and it, it does still bang on my head when I say the words, yeah, I, you know, my son, my son's, I have a dead, uh, my son, just the word dead, hmm. not death, not dying, dead is, is a, um, it's still inside punches. I don't have a son, so I don't know, you know, the experience about being a parent, but when right. you say, uh, it makes it easier to live with it, what I feel in my body is like this pressure building. And then you say it out loud. And it's like, okay, now I can go another, that's, another stint until the pressure builds again, and I need to move it out. That's pretty insightful. That's probably true. I never looked at it that way, but yeah, you know. So, and you want to do it. You want. You don't want it to be. You know, a lot of people like tiptoe around it with me because they're afraid of upsetting me, hmm. and I like to clear that out. It's like, no, it's okay. You know, I had two sons. One of them died. That happened. It's not, it's not, and that's what I meant when I said we'll go back to the heart now. This is a good segue back into that. You start to accept all of those things as just part of the journey. And what you really start to see is how much, our, how much conditioning we have around th things that, we, that are good and are nice and are wonderful, but we make them mandatory. We make them they we make them part of the American lifestyle. So if you lose a part of that, the horror is greater than it really is. Kids die, marriages break up, families break up, and don't speak to each other. That happens. To wallow around, wallow around in that because you think that you're supposed to by some kind of a unwritten moral code and then when it does happen it hits you much harder because it's not supposed that's not supposed to happen where does it say that so you start to accept the things in your life like when i got sober i ended up becoming estranged from my blood family because they wanted me to come to all these events where there was all this booze and i said i'm not going and they stopped talking to me i was like okay <laughs> i can do that too mm. So, but what happens is you do start to see you do start to see your own autonomy. You do start to see your own self that you can stand in the wind of all of this stuff of a, a mother and three sisters who won't talk to you and a, and a son who's died um, and a career that I left early for from because I was drinking and I knew I, I had to get out or I would have really done something stupid. Um, you can absorb all of those things and you can absorb them easily more easily if you take the 
the artificial cultural stigma off them. Then they just become, and when you do that, you also have to do that with your accomplishments. For a long time, I would carry around, and in the construction business in New York, I've done some pretty significant work. I used to carry that around like a badge. I did that building. I did that building. I did that building. Look at me. Mm -hmm. um, you let that go. Those buildings are there, and I participated in the building of it, but so did the plumber. <laughs> yeah. so did the electrician you know and, and just because I was the guy in charge of moving the paperwork around and, and managing the money doesn't mean that it was my building mm, mm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it has you have to work it as a double edged sword like with the modality and the healing I have to go to the healers and get their get what they have their talents are and, and put it into me but I have to do the work to make use of that energy mm. properly and not just keep, you know, having, you know, it's rely just on it. relying on it and just saying, okay, let me lay down, you know, mm -hmm. thank you very much. And now I'm going to go back to eating, you know, M&Ms and, and uh, drinking coffee and watching too much cable news. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of which, yes. would you like to take a break and lay down sure. and receive yeah, some yeah, healing? <laughs> yeah, no, it, it is. And I, I'm, I'm, you told me to talk, so I talked. Okay. And I enjoyed it. Okay. I, uh, yeah. So. I enjoyed every second of it. This is, uh, yeah, we're going to come back. We're going to talk a little bit more after okay. this session. Um, uh, you are going to do 13th Octave La Ho Chi, I believe. That's what you Yeah, I'm excited about it because I've never, I, until 40, a week ago, I never even heard of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, it's not really well known, I'm, I'm finding. As I've been doing this podcast, uh, most people are like, yeah, I want to do the 13th Octave because I've never heard of it and I've never received it and I don't know what it is. So uh, I'm actually thrilled to be giving so let me ask you a, question. a chance to... How did you come to it? How did you come across it? It found me, is what happened. Um, uh, there's a Reiki master that I have gone to to get healing, and I was looking through her website, uh, seeing what offerings she provides, and one of them is 13th Octave, and I was like, what's that? So I started researching 13th Octave, and I found a really deep draw to it and attachment to it uh it works with angels um it's like connecting to the heart of god and uh recentering uh our divinity and uh opening us up with that kind of healing and i just reached out to the this reiki master and she also teaches and attunes you in it and uh, signed up for it that's how i learned it wow yeah it was really fast and have you had the treatments yourself? I actually have not. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have not. Got you. <laughs> uh, I've been meaning to. I did it on myself once. Does it work when you self-administered? Yeah, I had a really... Um, it was right after I got it tuned, and I was um, playing with it and practicing it, and I did it on myself, and by the second position for me... I had this really big emotional release and I did not see coming and uh, I go okay I this is this is this is working this is wow. for me uh, and I've been enjoying giving it to people ever since um, okay and I'm looking forward to giving it to you right now let's go okay which way should I we'll be, be back back from Jim's 13th octave session and he was telling me a few things about his experience before we got back to the microphone I can I'm wondering if yeah yeah you'd like to I found it first of all I found the, the movement the energy movement very very deep I mean I was on this journey that I was that I wasn't asleep, but I was deep in in my consciousness, uh, and I, I found myself almost you know you could almost like almost falling asleep. But as soon as I would start to, it would stop me because I was holding the crystals. I could feel my hand, mm. you know, um, and opening. I'm trying to find words. I feel like I feel like an opening, like 
there was an opening into a deeper sense of relaxation, a, a, a deeper sense of chill, of like, ah, oh, okay, it's all okay, don't stop worrying. It made me see, it helped me see where the deeper, the, the roots of some of my character defects, mm. my, always, my desire to always please and to always um, impress. Better word is impress. Always impress. Like, wow, look what he did. You know. Mm. So, and I was able to see that a lot more clearly. I've known it, but I was able to see it a lot more clearly and not be as subject to it, not be as ruled by it. Same. Like there was some separation yeah, from there was it? Yeah, there was a little separate. Yeah, that's a good word. Thank you. Like there was some separation from it. Yeah. Wow. Um, I've understood some of this. I've done a lot of plant medicine and meditations and sound baths, but the last really deep plant medicine ceremony I went to, I was in Peru for over a month. I had done a two-week dieta, which is you sit in the jungle for two weeks and take a non-psychedelic plant medicine. But the last, and then your two weeks of just every other night attending Aya sessions. But the last one I had was violent. And it showed my life like an upside-down pyramid. So the point of the pyramid is on the ground. And the point of the pyramid represents your first thought your very as you come into the world at birth or infancy mm. and what i experienced as my first thought was this howling howling loneliness and isolation and feeling that i was completely alone it was awful and that lasted for hours and from that, though, I could see how every decision in my life from that point was in reference to that point. So it's like a, the, pole, every, the pyramid came from there. My life, people I was attracted to, people who were attracted to me, the work I did, you know, all the choices that I made in my life were really about sus nurturing that pain. And, and you don't even know it. It's completely mm -hmm. invisible. You're just functioning under it. But you, it's like like you don't think every minute, oh, I'm breathing air. Yeah. It's that unconscious. And it only became apparent there. And so now I've tried to work on that. But it's, it's a sinister, it's a very, very sinister mm. character defect because it's been there for so long. And even, like I said, even when you're trying to be honest and really vulnerable you're still doing it hmm. you're trying to get <laughs> approval for honesty and vulnerability now mm -hmm. <laughs> instead of carpentry and administration when you're doing the honesty and vulnerability does it feel uncomfortable like no uh, it doesn't because you're okay it, it doesn't it doesn't it feels good it feels like it, it's part of the i know but you're just hearing the voice yeah in the background yeah. while you're doing it yeah yeah, I wonder how they're like this. Yeah, you know. <laughs> so, so you you look. I'm also an alcoholic. All right, and I've been sober for years and years and years. But I have to remember, I'm an alcoholic. You can't think. You, I don't believe you. I, I don't believe that we ever in certain things. I don't know if you're ever really cured, or healed. You more are scarred, and you have to manage the scars. You mm. cannot think that you're ever, I believe, I cannot think that I'm ever fully healed or cured or saved or anything like that. I know I've been saved from the ravages of things, but I have to remember that I have a propensity for them. Yeah. I say this over and over again uh, when I talk to people about healing is, what the biggest thing I learned about healing is that, uh, especially with like one of my core wounds is, all of my wounds, but especially when I was working on my core wound, I was like, I, I need to heal this. I need this to be completely healed. When I finally realized that I'm never going to fully heal it, my job in healing is to integrate it into my life and to be with it in a more solid, full, uh, loving way. And that is the healing. Yes, that's really well said. Thank you. That's a, you've said it much better than I could. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's that's exactly... 
That's exact. And that is truly the benefit of this work. Mm. It's the it's the deeper, it's the more subtle, it's the more um, unrecognized aspects of it. The surface stuff is like, okay, I'm an alcoholic, stop drinking. And that I was able to do once for like 18 years. But I went back to it because I didn't do the work. I didn't, you know, and so I went to a recovery movement. Mm. And recovery is where they, best thing they ever told me was, it's not the drinking, it's the thinking. Mm. And they helped me, started me on the journey of seeing that. And then um, the plant medicine also, also helped. And then in the end, David helped because I did a reading with an energy reading with him years ago. Just so everyone knows, David is uh, a, a mutual friend of ours, David Savage, who uh, teaches emotional intelligence and uh, is also a very powerful empath. And he did a reading on me and he told me at the end of it, he says, there's deep childhood trauma there. Hmm. So the Aya told me, David told me. And then a few months later, I met a guy named Gabor Mate. Hmm. who's a Canadian psychologist who specializes in um, toxic toxic childhood trauma. And there, everything cleared. Hmm. And I could see it. I could see it all clearly. What uh, was that experience like of everything cleared? Uh, like what, what exactly is everything in that? Okay. I heard myself and I heard your question. Uh, <laughs> We are conditioned so strongly about family um, and we bow to that conditioning so strongly. But I needed to get out of my family. And I was in the process of doing that. But when you realize why, when you really understand why, it makes it, 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 it breaks down a lot of the conditioning really fast. It's like, no, that's not my mother. That's a woman who I lived in a, in a house with for a, a while. Hmm. You know, you start to change because we have those words, we're off the topic right now, but the words mother, father, family, they're so charged, so power. I mean, we have card companies that are built around those things. <laughs> <laughs> they're so powerfully charged. And you, and you think that to, to want to, to not want to be involved with them anymore, you f you feel abnormal. Mm. What, don't don't. What, how can I be so shallow? How could I not love my my mother? Because she didn't love me, <laughs> you know. So once you can accept the fact that you know what, none of these things are and are, are guaranteed, you know. It it makes it easier to to. To to start to take the to do the things that you need to do to stay healthy emotionally healthy and whole and not be subject uh, you can you can take quicker action because you're not held down by a false belief uh, and this is part of like what everything the yeah. false beliefs we're clearing yeah this is this is the, con, uh, conditioning yeah yeah it it really it it really is it's the clarity of that some of that's the age some of that's from the heart work. Mm. Some of that is like I'm looking at all this stuff, and I said earlier that you know I don't I I more see my life now as as a, as like a movie, and I was there and I was in this scene, I was in this scene, mm. I was in this scene, but I didn't make the movie. I did you know it's it it it's it's less it's it's less credit and less responsibility mm. at the same time, and that's liberating. You know, so it's just taking out the garbage. I had this. I I wrote a book about my core drama that has to do with my urethra and when I was writing it I realized that I was looking at these scenes in my life these really powerful potent scenes that had to do with my urethra that really affected me like traumatic things that I have a hard time letting go of and I was I was writing it I was looking at it from like a bird's eye view and I feel like that's what you're talking about like you're looking at it as a movie and it's more like a bird's eye view where you're seeing it all happen and you're like not as emotionally charged and in in it egoically more like oh i can see all these angles that i didn't really see before is that kind of what you're talking about when yeah. you say yeah you can you see that you see the picture more clearly and i understand that you know that, that's that's exactly right that's, that's exactly you, you you see it more clearly 
and it's not as terrorizing. It's just not as terrorizing as it as it used to be, you know. And also, there's no book, there's no play, there's no cultural um, methodology for this generation that I belong to. Most people, you know, in, in previous generations, the, they're, they're going past 65 and still being viable. There's no model for that. There's no model for, for, for partnership. There's no model for professionalism. There's no, because it's, you're, you're, we're here, but we have, but you have a whole lot more knowledge and a whole lot mm. more, you, you've changed. So we're all walking around, guys my age, trying to figure out what to do. And so what you, what you come to then is like, okay, I'm just going to do what I think is best. And um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different way of living in, in a way. Is there a, the word loneliness comes in to mind. Is there a loneliness in that? Like walking around wondering what you're going to do? There is, it can, it can be lonely. The loneliness can be either increased or decreased on why you why you think you feel lonely. Hmm. Right? <laughs> you know, I used to live in I used to live on Long Island in a house. It was fine. And then I moved to the West Village, and you'd walk out on Friday night, and this and the West Village is like loaded with outdoor cafes, and you walk and you see all these couples having dinner together. Mm -hmm. It's like, ooh, oh, I don't have to, oh. I'm alone, I'm alone, I'm alone. It's this conditioning. Because I noticed one weekend, I was a 4th of July weekend, I'm walking along the Hudson River and a couple is walking the other way and they're holding hands and they got the little picnic basket and their bottle of wine. And I thought to myself, oh, thank God, I don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> 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 and I looked at the guy and I thought, he's looking at me going, geez, I wish I was him. <laughs> Excuse me. You know, so yeah. you, you, it, it's, it, when you start to see that, you, st and you start to learn to appreciate your own company. So, yeah, I mean, the honest answer is there was one partner that I've had over the years, and I've had, you know, a few, who if I would, I have, say there's at least half of me that would, if she would, and we still keep in touch, would say, you want to try this thing one more time? I'd probably say hmm. yes. Hmm. But because it's not there, I'm not miserable. It's like, it's like added. You mean because it's not there? Because I don't have that person in my life to, on a day-to-day -day basis today. I'm not miserable. Mm. But I would like it. Mm. So it's more of a preference than a need. And I've noticed things like that. That's mm. age, too. You know, you um, you become a little bit more introvert, in, internal. Mm. So, no, there isn't any... There can be loneliness, but not much, mm. you know. Um, it's offset by the freedom, by the liberation. Mm. It really is, you know. And then community helps. Yes, it does. The community can diffuse eighty percent of it, mm -hmm. you know, because it's it's especially a, a this community where there's lots of emotional, honest emotional interplay. You know, it's not just a bunch of bros watching a football game. Mm -hmm. This is the work. This is all of this stuff is is trying to bring break down all the toxic masculinity, all the toxic childhood stuff, mm. and at the same time be a man. You know, I, I used to really get, I, the first time I got into this work, I, I went to India to an ashram. And I'm from Brooklyn. <laughs> you know, ah, come on, fuck that shit. You know, mm -hmm. and, then I have all, and then I have all these guys speaking to me in these like slow, holy voices. Well, you know, my third chakra is just, I was like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> That's me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I never, I'm, I'm, I'm a little arrogant, mm -hmm. I'm a little short tempered, and I'm a little profane. What that <clears throat> brings up the question to me, what, uh, when I was doing the incantations to start the Laho Chi session, I was wondering what your feelings of those were. Like, have you opened up more to that kind of stuff? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I, I recognize so much of this, this just an energy modality that we as a species, I believe this, that we as a species are might have had it one time, might not have. The indigenous people did. But us as Western man have all that capacity, but we've lost the ability 
to tap into mm. the energy of the divine world, for mm. lack of a better word. So there are different modalities and different methodologies to get in there. I go see people who have access to them. Mm -hmm. And they tap in and they bring it here. So what the methodology is, whether it's an archangel or whether it's, you know, a Buddhist, whether it's, um, what's the, hmm. the, the elephant? Um, the, uh, Hindu? Yeah, the Hindu elephant, Hindu? the one, the reliever of paths. Um, anyway, whether it's one of those, it doesn't make any difference. It's it's all being pulled in through you know and whatever you, the modality that the that the that the teacher has, they can use that to bring energy into you. So whether mm -hmm. it's whether it's thirteen uh, octave, or whether it's um, tonals like Aaron does, or whether it's craniosacral like Jennifer who was here the other night does, mm -hmm. or the most common one that we all kind of accept is um, acupuncture. Yeah. That's a physical kind of thing, but it's the same kind of thing. It's all the same thing. It's it's bringing the stuff in and opening and getting it inside you so you can open up and be a better, more spiritual cosmic being. Mm. That's what I believe. Mm. So I will, and so here for me, in experiencing this, this definitely has power. Mm. I can almost cry saying that. Mm. It's that strong inside of me right now. Wow. This definitely is your calling mm. you bring it mm. brother <laughs> mm. thank you you're welcome but you really do and i'm i'm you know me mm -hmm. i'm pretty pretty <laughs> plain spoken yeah yeah <laughs> and that was like wow you know i could but i also could feel it almost immediately mm. within minutes of lying on the table i goes this shit's going down <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing yeah that's so amazing you, i think you need that feedback too mm. Because you need the, you need it to, is helpful. you need to know that so you can so you can rise up and go forward with more power. Mm. Yeah. So it yeah it really it was really something you know and it's it's just you know I'm in the middle of it I have to remember that I'm in the middle of it mm. and I just have to keep paddling. Mm. You know I'm not at the shore yet and I yeah. will be at the shore when I die. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just mm. I'm not afraid of it I just don't want it yet. I yeah. Too much to do. <laughs> You know, I still gotta be with my grandchildren some more, mm. and I still gotta do some more stuff. And uh, and I, at this point, I'm in a unique spot. I don't know anybody in this community that's my age, not even not even within ten years. Mm. Wow, <laughs> you yeah. Know? So it's my chance to 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 bring this age into this work, and then be able to bring it back to younger people and say, hey, you know, this is you should really you know, make time in your lives for this. Like, you know, what you're doing now to bring it back to the 13th, you know, mm. to this, it's definitely important. We want to start teaching people about consciousness. They don't know. I didn't know. Every person counts. Yeah. We need them all. Yeah. We can inform people mm -hmm. of what we've learned and about consciousness or about healing and as much as we tell them they have to find it themselves yeah. they can hear and they can hear and they can hear but until that little that thing in their body can like goes yes i want to hear it that's theirs to do and yeah. all we can do is keep and, and I sharing think, uh thoughts and love yeah and i think some people are more prone to it than others yeah. Some of it may be life circumstances. It just might be genetics. Well, thank you. got you. a lot of material here, brother. I do. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for uh, sitting with me and oh, I, sharing I, so much of your story and life. And, uh, and you should do this because I needed this conversation mm. as much as I needed that treatment. It's important because uh, I have to get this out yeah. to the world. And I have to... It's so important to say things out loud. Yeah, it is. Because if you keep them inside, they can have different degrees of greatness and lessness, and, and you don't have any, you have no way to say it. When you, That's what I liked about having a therapist. Mm -hmm. When I would say things out loud, I would hear how valuable or how stupid they were. I was actually thinking that same thing, uh, that this is important. Before we went into the energy healing, I was like, oh, wow, the process of actually... Uh, letting people talk and say their story and say what's going on with them 
and then do an energy healing can be a very powerful thing. It's 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 really good. I yeah. mean, it's it's really mm-hmm. fucking good. <laughs> okay, great. No, it really is because it's yeah. it's it's important. You know, um, it's it's it, it has to become more and more mainstream. Well, I appreciate I appreciate you being here with me and uh, talking so freely about your experience, and then uh, taking time to experience what I have to offer. Uh, You're more I, than welcome. Well, thank you. We're going to. Say goodbye. Uh, say goodbye to you all. And I also want to put out my invite to all of you to make a little room for healing in your life. And I will talk to you later.